Having recently embarked upon a journey out west, uh, I was given ample time to think. Uh, It takes almost 30 hours to drive to Glacier National Park in Montana, after all. And and as I passed through farms and prairies and surprisingly frequent car graveyards, I reflected on the how the huge hay bales um, scattered the the landscape like an unmarked tombstone. I reflected on why birds in Montana, in particular, on a certain highway, were really obsessed with the front of my van, um, and became well acquainted very quickly and for the last time. And I considered uh, how mesmerizing it was that so many bison and horses and pronghorn and deer roamed freely and fearlessly uh, among among men and cars, though perhaps they should have a little more fear, uh, just ask the deer that exploded underneath my van. Uh, But that's another story for another day. So as one who traveled very little growing up, I have still never been on a plane Uh, I am always filled with awe, wonder, and gratitude when I'm given the opportunity to explore God's creation. Uh, Among my musings included the very means of travel. It is not lost on me that it was not long ago that Lewis and Clark boarded ships on rivers while I took a vehicle that can comfortably maintain speeds of 90 miles per hour, uh, except when trampling deer. Uh, I maintain 90, but not comfortably. Those who went before me ventured west, lacking not only a GPS embedded in the pocket computers we call smartphones, but they were lacking a map altogether. Now we have options. Uh, We can ask someone for directions, I can stop at a rest stop for a free map, uh, or I can enter an address into Google Maps. Talking to someone along the way could result in a new friend. Uh, It could also result in being led astray or worse. I have a terrible sense of direction, so I'm comforted by the fact that my phone can audibly tell me when I've missed a turn and I can be driving in here recalculating. Uh, That's that's a good thing, Uh, and yet, which which a paper map cannot do. But a paper map can also not sell my information or serve as a portal into the depths of human depravity. Uh, And so there are risks and rewards to each option. And it's this assessment of risk and reward Uh, that I think really lies at the heart of this fortress of technology. Some, such as the Amish, engage minimally in technological development in order to develop and maintain values of simplicity, wishing to avoid contamination by association with a world whose technological progress is driven largely by violence, greed, and largely non-Christian values. Meanwhile, many other Christians believe in order to reach people today, we have to get with the times. Uh, Celebrating technological breakthrough as though it's a modern-day miracle from the very hand of God himself. And so we kind of see these two extremes of how we deal with technology. Some run away from it and say, tis, tis, evil. Others celebrate it and, and elevate it. And so how is a Christian to balance these things out? Well, if you're here today, you've joined us in the midst of a series on fortresses. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so a fortress in this sense is any thought or lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Uh, Thus far, Ben has covered self-sufficiency, apathy, and sexuality, and this week we turn our attention to this fortress of technology. Uh, So to attack it, we're going to start off with tools in time, uh, not tool time. Uh, We're going to contrast our technological condition with the character of God, and we're, we're going to conclude by highlighting how modern problems require ancient solutions. And so let's pray and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, how good it is to gather with those uh, we love and care about, uh, those who ultimately love and care about you. Um, And so, Lord, as as we come together uh, in your name to sing your praises, to study your word, we pray that you would bless us. Uh, We pray that you would give us wisdom and insight insight, uh, into your word. We pray that we would be given wisdom and insight into who you are. Uh, And we pray that we would walk more faithfully in accordance with your teachings, um, having come together. Lord, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So when I say technology, what are some of the first things that come to mind for you? Now, what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor and actually tell them, like, what is the first image or thought you had when you hear the word technology? Go. 
Hold on a minute. All right, so what are, what are some of the things we had? To, PT up here is like the wheel. Uh, he's, he's on the right track. What, what else? Huh? Computers. What else? Phones. Video games. What's that? Microwaves. Amen. Yes. I, I eat many a dinner out of microwaves. So yeah, all kinds of, of technology. You know, whether it's smartphones, computers, social media, televisions... Oftentimes, digital tech can dominate, but it's by no means the only kind. Uh, did you consider the car, van, jeep, motorcycle, however you got here? Uh, did you consider the very chairs you're sitting in uh, that are the products of many minds and machines having worked together in order to produce this product for you? Uh, did you think of Kip singing in Napoleon Dynamite, of his great affection for technology? Or did you think of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the prophetic film, uh, Terminator? In, in which we see the rise of the machines and the coming apocalypse. And so to destroy a fortress, one must first know at least a few details about it. Uh, for instance, what is it? Where is it? Um, technology can be this overwhelming fortress to conquer, right? Like we, we got computers to wheels uh, when, I, when I asked you guys what technology is. That's, that's a range. And so when we're trying to address this fortress, where do we start? Well, let me try to simplify matters by identifying the foundation of the fortress. Ultimately, I believe technology is the stewardship of tools and time. Technology is the stewardship of tools and time. Now, this isn't the definition you'll find in a dictionary or at some tech university, but I think it's consistent with the biblical worldview on the one hand and real life on the other, which are two things that I'm very passionate about trying to bring together to, and integrating. And so let's consider these three components of the definition, stewardship, tools, time. So to start with stewardship, a, a steward in the New Testament was a household manager, Usually a freed slave who, who's been entrusted with the management of property or finances or both. Christians are stewards, very much in this sense. We were formerly slaves to sin. We've been set free by the blood of Christ and entrusted with the management of our master's riches. Uh, whether it's the proclamation of the gospel or the attitude we have when washing deer off the bottom of our van. Um, it's all stewardship. And so we have to recognize that's part of who we are as Christians, is we are constantly stewarding that which God has entrusted to us. Uh, some of it might seem more glamorous to other, than others, but it's all stewardship. Jesus made this clear in a number of parables. Paul and other apostles embodied and articulated this truth. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul writes, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. We see your body is not your body. It ultimately belongs to the Lord. You are simply a manager of it. Uh, though Paul said this in the context of, of sexual sin, it is a 24-7 truth for believers. All of Christian life is stewardship in general. And so technology is the stewardship of tools and time in particular. We're always managing something that belongs to something else. Our very life is not our own. It belongs to the Lord. Secondly, we have tools. Now, when you swing a hammer at a nail, you probably don't think of yourself as engaging uh, in technological breakthrough, but that's exactly what you're doing. We tend to realize this, though, when our tools are missing. You don't appreciate it, uh, or you don't appreciate the technological marvel of the porcelain throne until you find yourself out on a hike miles away from one. But that's another story from our trip out west for another day. Now, tools have become more sophisticated and complicated over time, but at the end of the day, they're still just tools. Whether we're talking about the Stone Age, the Iron Age, the Industrial Age, or our present digital age, they're all just tools. Maps, smartphones, tools. Some more complex than others, but they're just tools. And as somebody who's really not a tech guy, like I, I hate it, just, just confession, I'm not a tech guy. Um, I, I find it very helpful to, to simplify things and recognize that it's really just this stewardship of tools and time. Now, I wanted to pause here and address a, a common temptation that people have, and that is to blame the tool. Uh, for instance, every shooting brings with it calls for legislation against tools. Uh, those who grew up before the digital age see younger generations absorbed in phones and video games and are quick to blame screens. 
uh, from, they, they blame the television, they blame the computer for rotting the mind of the child. Uh, kids these days, they say. Uh, we scoff under, under our breath as youth in public huddle up to outlets in the corner uh, to stay connected while at the same time disconnecting for all, from all the rest of society. Um, and yet, we need to realize that kids these days are the products of parents these days. Um, and, and so we need to take that very seriously and look in the mirror and consider how we have contributed to this. The temptation is to blame tools. Uh, this isn't new. Socrates bemoaned the rise of books uh, and writing as something that would utterly destroy society and, and really destroy wisdom. Hear this, as recorded by Plato. This is, this is such a rich quote. And so it is that you, by reason of your tender regard for the writing that is your offspring, have declared the very opposite of its true effect. If men learn this, this being writing and the development of books, uh, if men learn this, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory uh, because they rely on that which is written, calling to remembrance no longer from within themselves, but by means of external marks. Uh, really condemning when I think about my inability to get from point A to point B always uh, without digital things. He continues, and so it is that you by reason, um, excuse me, what you have discovered is a recipe not for memory, but for a minder. And it is no true wisdom that you offer your disciples, but only the semblance of wisdom. For by telling them of many things without teaching them, you will make them seem to know much, while for the most part they know nothing. And as men filled not with wisdom, but with the conceit of wisdom, they will be a burden to their fellows. That was books. Uh, and, and so just consider uh, how, how really all of society has lamented the, the current technology of their day and said, it, back in my day, it was better. And so, every generation cries, cries out against this, whether the tablet is made of stone or screen. There is nothing new under the sun. Tools are not to blame for the withering of the mind, the degradation of society, or a whole host of e other evils. You are. I am. We are. The sin within our hearts is ultimately to blame for these problems. It is not anything outside of us. It is within us, and we have to look in the mirror and recognize as often as we want to blame everything else for all of the problems, the problem is within. We blame guns because we don't want to confess the fact that rage and violence stews within us. We blame screens and video games because it's easier than admitting that we are often lazy parents who are quick to hire cheap babysitters or cartoons rather than engage in the long-suffering of parental discipline. We blame our phones and computers for making access to pornographic material easy because we don't want to look in the mirror and confess the fact that we are faithless uh, in comparison, or we are faithless, quick to abandon promises made to our creator and spouse alike. Jesus told Peter and the disciples in no uncertain terms where this depth of evil comes from. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 15. We'll be there for just a moment. Start with verse 15. Peter said to him, this is Peter talking to Jesus, Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. Well, pause. What is the parable? Well, if you rewind and go to verses 10 and 11, you'll see a very brief parable. Um, verse, so back, rewinding to verse 10. After Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. And so what they were dealing with is the Pharisees, uh, and really most Jews at the time, believed in contact impurities. That is, you could touch certain things that would cause you to become unclean and therefore separate you from God. Uh, contact impurities ranged from lepers to bacon. Uh, and, and so you can touch all kinds of different things and thereby be separated from God. And so ultimately the parable, the debate, is on what separates you from God, what makes you clean. Jesus continues, verse 16. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. And so it is not the external 
that makes us unclean. It is not the external that defiles us, but the overflow of the heart. Uh, Each of us has to be able to look in the mirror and say, I am to blame for every sin in my life. Tools or lack thereof merely reveal that which was already in our heart. Screens don't make people lazy. Lazy hearts simply result in lazy living. Screens just reveal what was already there. Hangry people aren't, hang- aren't angry because they don't have food. The fact is, the lack of food just reveals the fact that they're angry people. Um, and, and so I think it's very important that we recognize that we so often medicate with, whether it's technology or food or all kind of other things, but when we really think about it, we are wicked people deep within, uh, and we simply mask this a lot of the time. Remove the mask, and our wickedness is exposed. Sin is far more pervasive than we tend to think. Thirdly, time. Technology is the stewardship not only of tools, but also of time. If you read any history, as I've been trying to do lately, you may be shocked by just how much these people accomplished uh, with much less sophisticated tools. Uh, It is very humbling to think about all of these works of art and all of these things that were accomplished, and I look at the clock and I'm like, I... uh, cleaned the dishes. And, and so it's, it's pretty, pretty humbling to, to make these comparisons. And so we must ask ourselves what we've done with the time we've gained through better tools. Now, in considering the usefulness of any tool, we must assess the risk and reward. In our digital age, this is especially true. Parents, if you're unaware of, the, of what the constant stimulation of screens is doing to your young children, I'd really urge you to check out the book, The Digital Invasion. Uh, it's by Hart and Fredged. Uh, technology is often credited with shedding awareness on emotional and mental disorders. And while there's some truth to that, I really have become convinced that they have contributed to and developed and created as many of these as they have exposed. Um, I, I really believe that our constant engagement with all of these things is shaping within us just as many problems as, as it's curing. And so young brains were not intended for the onslaught of stimulation that we've simply permitted. Uh, The impact of screen stimulation on the brain is comparable to that of gambling and cocaine use. Uh, And and so it's something to take very seriously. It's worth noting that when you shove your kid in front of a screen for eight hours, you you are really inviting some damage into their mind. Um, And so according to one survey, the global average of time spent daily in front of a screen is nearly how many hours a day? Any guess? You listened to the first? No, that was actually perfect. Well done, my man. So, seven. He's like, got this. Any other questions? So, but I, but I like you guys, so let's assume uh, that you're better than average, and you only spend six hours a day uh, in, in front of a screen. That would amount to about 42 hours a week, or 91 full days a year uh, in front of a screen. Now, some of that can be accounted for with work and, and whatnot, uh, the, the, the writing of this sermon, I was in front of a screen a lot. It, it happens. But by comparison, say you are one of the faithful who has a strong devotional time in the Word, and you spend approximately 30, day, 30 minutes a day in prayer and scripture reading. This translates to about seven and a half full days a year uh, in devotion to God and a whopping 91 full days a year in tech. And so we have to consider the risk and reward of these things. Reading the Bible on your phone may make it easier to do word studies or use Bible memorization apps, and praise God for that. But if you find yourself constantly distracted by every notification while trying to read this, maybe you need to go to the ancient physical scrolls um, of, of of our forefathers and not the digital scroll that is distracting you. And so the language we use of social media is very interesting. In a recent interview I listened to, uh, they were talking about the different characteristics of all these social media things. And they talked about how uh, when it comes to Instagram, it's all about envy. And it's also all about gluttony. Think about it. What are you doing? You're looking at a Facebook feed uh, because you're, you're just taking in and feeding yourself with all of this stuff. Uh, Twitter, all about anger. Facebook, well, it's all about selling you. <laughs> Congratulations, product. And so they're all involved in, in these heinous sins. And so regardless of your thoughts about how accurate some of that is, it's still very startling language. And to clarify, do I think that all of these things are inherently evil? Yes, no. I I, I do not. Uh, I mean, I'm wearing this apparatus on my head uh, in order to communicate not only to you, but to a a world online. 
Uh, I am currently have a smartphone in my pocket, and I'll probably definitely use it this week to find the Blair's house. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And, and so I don't think these things are inherently evil, but I think there's a strong risk and reward to each of them that we really have to consider and manage each time that we're, we're using this stuff. After all, the misuse of a hammer can lead to a broken finger, and the misuse of many other tools can cut off your finger, uh, as evidenced in this church. But uh, when it comes to... That, that joke went over much better first service. Jeez. I keep, I keep comparing. Taking notes. What work jokes work where? All right. But ultimately, the misuse of social media can feed a sick heart. Um, Paul's counsel comes in 1 Corinthians 10.23. He writes, All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Now, Paul is dealing with food sacrifice to idols, concluding ultimately that in many contexts it may be good and edifying, but in other cases it really may not be. The same principle applies here. Are you free to engage in using tools? Sure. Uh, If Paul says you can eat a steak sacrificed to a demon, uh, then I think he'd permit the use of more risky social media if it is used to edify and build up the church. Can this be done? Absolutely. And, I, and so I encourage you to let this verse serve as a, a lens of sorts through which you consider your own use of these things. Is it edifying? Is it building up? Is it profitable? Is it helping the kingdom or not? And so to consider further what these things can do not only for us but to us, let's reflect on our technological condition and the character of God. Now, when was the last time you saw a loading screen and thought, oh, how wonderful, now I have so much time to think? Or, when was the last time you saw the price of a Starbucks drink and thought, my heavens, how affordable? Now, these seemingly trivial observations are steps toward identifying values of our technological world. Now, to speak of the values of a culture or a movement really requires some broad generalizations on my part, and a rather forgiving congregation on your part, so I ask you not to get too lost in the specifics, but to kind of consider the broad principles that we're talking about here. And so, let us start with our technological condition. What do I mean by condition? Well, if I were to call your work, if you were to call your work and say, I'm going to be late, there are severe, there are road conditions. Now, in most cases, your, your employer is going to assume that there is traffic Uh, or an accident. However, the conditions could be so nice that you decided to pull over and enjoy the sunshine instead of rotting away in a cubicle all day. And and so the conditions can differ. To speak of skin conditions usually is associated with something very negative. We we tend to think of conditions automatically as bad. Skin conditions, bad. Road conditions, bad. But as we can see, there are some positives as well. Now, typically, when our world speaks of our technological condition, it is in exclusively positive terms. You know, growth, development, progress. Slogans like, in science, there is hope, uh, or trust the science. Uh, These are ultimately uh, religious sayings masquerading as slogans. Uh, These are religious, and ultimately, I think it reveals the edifice of the fortress that we're contending with today. So often, something neutral or potentially good, like technology, is hijacked and and used for evil things. Uh, And in the process, we see that they become religious in nature. And so if you want to know the values of our technological world, look no further than commercials. Commercials show us really what the world thinks of you, and it's not very highly. And I remember just, it was like 10 years ago, this Sprint commercial that left an impression on me because it concluded with the saying, something along the lines of, you have the right to be unlimited. And, and I remember hearing that and thinking, you know, what an audacious claim. Uh, how, how bold. I, I do not have such a right. <laughs> and, and yet that is what they're trying to make you think so that you will invest in these things. Uh, that's another religious claim, simply masquerading, masquerading as a sprint slogan. And so consider three sets of values that characterize our technological world. First off, efficiency and immediacy. For example, the highway. Some roads move with the land, others cut straight through it. Highways quite literally move mountains and erase beautiful landscapes in the name of efficiency and immediacy. I remember as a kid driving through Kentucky, looking at these walls of rock, not realizing that truly it was just dynamited to get there. 
Or consider the irony of a group of annoyed people oh, waiting in line to be amused at King's Island. You know, the, these are things that, that happen all the time. Or we roll our eyes at, on, our, on our phones doing a million things in a matter of seconds because it didn't do it fast enough. And so, I want it now captures these values. And th- there are values that in many ways... I think, are at odds with how we come to understand the Lord. Because we, we've been conditioned to think that if you want it, you get it now. You deserve it. You have the right. And then suddenly we engage in prayer with the Lord and we realize, well, Amazon delivers faster than God. Um, and and we, we start to have these issues because, you know, we've been trained to think that this is how the world should work. And then we have a relationship with other people. We have a relationship with the Lord. And that's not how things happen. And so it creates within us this, this disconnect in, in which we, we have a very hard time not understanding why God, or we have a very hard time understanding why God is the way He is. Uh, why doesn't He act consistently with what I'm seeing? Additionally, our world is all about comfort and security. Many of our complaints are rooted in some lack of comfort. Uh, many say, it's too hot. Then many say it's too cold. Uh, there's fans up here, so that I often, or there used to be. Oh yes, there is, so that I can preach in comfort. Uh, there, there are so many things designed to make us feel as happy as we possibly can at all times. Consider the question: Will I be safe? And how often we use that question as a filter as to whether or not we should do something. Now, in some cases, great filter. Uh, don't do drugs; they're not safe. Don't hit a deer; it's not safe. Uh, these, these are good filters to have, or a good question to have. But on the other hand, it becomes a much more difficult question when we consider the fact that we have a great commission to fulfill. Uh, consider mission trips. Should safety and security be valued over the need to communicate the gospel to people who have never heard it? We all want the gospel to reach the ends of the earth uh, until we realize that it's going to be our kids going to the ends of the earth. Uh, I still remember uh, one, one guy telling me at my last church, they had nightmares about his children going into ministry for a number of reasons. Now as a church deacon. And, and, and so it, it's very humbling to think uh, that we so often value these, these technological values over and against values of the scriptures. Um, there's a lot about following Jesus that simply is not comfortable or safe. Finally, our technological world values items being cheap and excessive. Consider a buffet, of which I'm a connoisseur of sorts. Uh, now, I have one of the best CC's stories of all time. If you don't know CC's, it's an all-you-can-eat pizza shop. But I will not tell it to you now because it's disgusting. But if you'd like to hear it later. So, uh, consider a buffet. One might say it allows you to try a variety of foods at the same time, but I've been to enough buffets to know that a successful buffet item is all buffet outing is ultimately measured in plates and dollars uh, because there's, there's this like offset that happens. Like you spend $12 up front, one plate, but with each plate, you are, you're, it's an investment, right? Like you're, you're saving up. And, and so you want to maximize plates to maximize what you spent. Consider further our desire to not just consume cheaply, but excessively. A common example of this is binge watching. Now, somehow we can go from having never heard of a television show yesterday to having watched two seasons of it by tomorrow. Um, it's incredible that we, we all have that. And, and I see parent, people looking at each other like, uh, yeah, that's, that's us. I've been there. Um, I, I get it. it it's somehow we, we all say, I have no time, but <laughs> from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m., I somehow find several hours to watch that. And so it's It's incredible. And yet Jesus talks about a treasure hidden in a field which is more worth more than everything you have. Jesus' disciples were told to follow him with nothing and to depend on the hospitality of strangers for their survival. And so let's consider some characteristics of God as they contrast from these technological values. God really does not value efficiency and immediacy quite like we do. Uh, in Genesis 15, 16, God waits over 400 years to execute a judicial decision. He doesn't care about if, if you want him to do it right now. He's going to do it when he wants to. Uh, God's promise to Abraham of descendants like the stars takes thousands of years to be answered. God's prophets frequently cry out, How long, O Lord? 
And so a God who operates exclusively by values of efficiency and immediacy would not leave his flock behind to rescue one wandering sheep. He would not give lost sinners time to be saved. He would simply render punishment immediately and efficiently. Instead of being efficient and immediate, God's character is just and complete. And really all of my observations of God's seeming slowness in the Bible, it always has this characteristic of justice on display. He he is waiting to execute punishment or he is waiting to um, do something because he ultimately wants to act in the most just way possible. God, the judge of all human hearts, works according to his time, not ours, because in his time he is thorough and just, not immature um, and reactive. Secondly, uh, God is also suffering and sacrificial. God's, God's will for your life, I can summarize God's will for your life in like 10 words. God's will for your life is to make you more like Jesus. That's it. Uh, God's desire, God's plan, God's will is that you become more and more like his son. This brings with it an ample amount of suffering and sacrifice. Now, yes, the resurrection will bring comfort and security. It will bring the wiping away of every tear. But comfort and safety are not his ultimate goals for you in this life. Abraham was commanded to sacrifice Isaac. His security was to come from God, not his child. Jesus prayed for forgiveness for those who crucified him, though he had the power to call an army from heaven. Peter likewise writes in 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. In other, way, in other words, are things going bad for you? Don't be shocked. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And so instead of comfort and security, God calls us to endure with long suffering and to live sacrificially. Again, we see how these values really are at odds. And finally, when given free and abundant manna, the Israelites were to take only what they needed. They were to learn even when they were given a free excess, they were only to take what they needed in order to learn a true daily trust in the Lord. Jesus fed thousands, but he also told them that there was a bread that they didn't know about that could, feed, that could satisfy them forever. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Jesus, when many came to him asking to become a disciple, said, You need to, you need to consider the cost first. You need to count the cost. You need to consider what this is going to do to you. This is not a highway to fame or fortune. And so, and so instead of being cheap and excessive, God invites us into costly discipleship, living lives that ultimately resist temptation. Now, to be fair, there are times when God does act consistently with the values of our technological world. It was efficient that one man died for the sins of all. When we call upon the name of the Lord in faith, we are saved immediately by grace, a free gift of God. There is nothing more comforting than the eternal security that comes from from a lasting hope in Jesus. The cost of our salvation was the blood of Jesus. Nothing we could do. The problem is not with these values alone, but when these values are elevated as the meaning of life. And so, as is always the case when we exchange the creator for the created, they become a cheap parody of the gospel message. Now, it has been said that modern problems require modern solutions. Uh, They require, they don't. They require ancient solutions because modern problems are, in fact, ancient problems pretending to be new ones. Now, you may say, but what about AI? To which I would say, well, it's a small fort the Israelites failed against because Achan happened to take when they plundered Jericho. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate that, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. You should uh, read Joshua. And you'll, you'll get the reference. But we come back. Uh, AI, I'm referring to artificial intelligence. And when it comes to artificial intelligence, mathematician and brilliant Christian John Lennox provides some really helpful insight. Uh, he has a book called 2084, obviously kind of a spinoff of 1984 in that sense. And it's an examination of many of the ethical questions that Christians have to wrestle with in this day and age. 
I'm not done with it, so the back half might be bad, but I tend to trust Linux. I'd recommend it. Even if it's not all good, um, I still think it's a very helpful way of processing some of what's going on in our world in a, in a very Christian way. So he points out there's narrow AI. Narrow AI is a system involving a database that does some picking and choosing whose output is something that usually requires human intelligence. Now, I'm not a tech guy. I hear stuff like that, and I'm like, I I don't know what you just said. Um, And and so kind of just to translate, uh, if you've ever used a smartphone or a search engine or a Google Assistant or anything like that, you're engaging with AI all the time. And so you, you might already think, like, these things are wicked, these things are terrible. Well, you're engaging with these things, so you need to think about if you actually believe that. Uh, and so there is that. And, and these things aren't, I think, inherently evil, but there are concerns. For example, your search engines are creating a database on you. Uh, I joked earlier, but it's true, you are a product. Uh, in many ways... Uh, they, they are selling you. Your ads reflect your search in- history and interests. So if you ever are looking at something and you think, well, that's really weird, probably need to stop searching weird stuff. Uh, it, it reflects you. Uh, and so when you search for AI conspiracy theories uh, or on Google, you're engaging with AI as they look through a million different things to try to show you what they think you want to see. Sometimes this manifests itself as an invasion of privacy. Other times it manifests itself as an order on Amazon. Uh, it's, it's quite a range that, that happens. You get the point. And so no matter how uncomfortable you are with these things, you're engaging with it. And I, I think there's a sense in which that's inevitable, and that's all right. Uh, this is an area in which we need to proverbially have our feet washed every single day. Uh, we need to look in the mirror very regularly and ask ourselves what these things are doing to us and how we're engaging with them. I don't think narrow AI is the problem. Secondly, we have general AI. Linux notes that um, this refers to a system that can do everything human intelligence can do and more faster and more efficiently. This level of AI has yet to be achieved, but boy, are they trying to. And and so this is kind of what we're talking about when, when we think about the merging of humanity with machine. And we hear all this weird stuff about chips getting put in people, and we're like, that's not right. Um... It's not. And so history professor Yuval Harari said in a 2015 interview about AI that it will, that it will inevitably lead to man becoming like gods. Uh, from, from the interview, he says, this isn't a poetic metaphor or a vague metaphysical claim. It's a concrete prediction. Throughout history, humans have ascribed to gods specific abilities, such as to design and create living beings to reshape their own bodies, to control the environment and the weather, to read minds and to communicate instantly across space, and to escape death and live indefinitely. Now that is the heart of secular religious technology, conquering death, the pursuit of eternal life. These are issues of deep relevance to the Christian. Harari continues, Humans are in the process process of acquiring all these abilities and then some. Business as usual will bring us there. If humankind simply carries on with its present economic, scientific, and political patterns, humans are very likely to be upgraded into gods within a century or two at most. Yet the same technology technology that may upgrade human to gods may also make them useless. Uh, it's this transhuman pursuit that is going beyond just physical humanity uh, that has many Christians reasonably concerned. Uh, You combine that with end times debates about the mark of the beast, and suddenly we find ourselves in a predicament. Um, But I would say, fear not. God laughs at the wicked, knowing that their day is coming. And so when we hear all of this psychosis, I would encourage you to know that a transhuman pursuit to become like gods is nothing new. Uh, This is not a new problem. This is among the very first problems. Genesis 3.5 For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. This is speaking of the tree. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then we go ahead a little bit to Genesis 6. An interesting passage. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. That is, angelic entities having unsanctioned sexual unions with mankind. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. 
Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Then we fast forward a little bit more to more crazy. Genesis 11, 1 through 4. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name. That is a divinity claim. If you remember our discussion on the Ten Commandments about bearing the name, it's trying to make a name for themselves is a divinity claim. They're saying, Come, let us become like God. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And so mankind, enticed with becoming like God, took the fruit. Given our subject matter, it's odd that Apple's logo is an apple with a bite out of it, but that's a campfire conspiracy for another day. Now, mankind, striving to become like gods by making a name for themselves, were scattered and confused. And in between those two events, we have the, the flood in which God condemned an unsanctioned union between angelic entities and mankind in Genesis 6. All of that is to say, humanity, uh, striving to become like gods through unsanctioned, abominable unions, isn't new. It's rather ancient. And God has dealt with it himself each and every time. Uh, And I think that's something we have to really take seriously. For example, he banished uh, Eve and Adam and the serpent from the garden. He himself sent a flood uh, to destroy the unholy union that was created in Genesis 6. He himself scattered mankind in Genesis 11 when they tried to build up a tower. And so I only wonder, when we're pursuing these things, what kind of judgment we're storing up for ourselves. Uh, Our Lord is very creative, after all. And so, when does technology become a fortress raised up against the knowledge of God? Ultimately, when it pursues God-like status through unholy unions, such as the ones we've talked about. When it promises to provide escape from death, when it boasts of being the source of hope, salvation, and eternal life. These are counterfeit false gospels. Death has already been conquered by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Victory did not come with the tools of algorithms and computer chips, but a hammer and nails. Idols reveal their own uselessness and incompetence. Scripture routinely mocks idols that have mouths but do not speak and eyes that do not see. The good news of the gospel is not that man becomes like God, but it's that God became man and dwelt amongst us that we might know him and have eternal life. Love does not ascend or transcend, it already descended. In the person of Jesus who emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant made in the likeness of man. Now, not all fortresses are conquered in the same way. Some, such as self-sufficiency and apathy, must be utterly destroyed and burned to the ground in your life. There's no place for them. And yet others, such as sexuality and technology, really cannot be destroyed or should not be destroyed, but mastered and taken over. And so we are to flee idolatry, but we cannot flee our body, nor can we flee engaging with our world. And so let's conclude with some principles for mastering technology in our own lives. Some of these, these ideas are going to be kind of hit or miss for you individually, just kind of consider what would be relevant. Uh, So first off, with regards to mastering technology, technology is meant to be a supplement, not a replacement. A supplement, not a replacement. Socrates was on to something when he was complaining about the development of writing. Uh, Your parents are on to something when they talk about how kids these days have their minds rotten. Uh, there's, There's some legitimacy to these concerns. You can research the Bible more effectively and efficiently now than ever. In seconds, you can access Greek and Hebrew and other translations and videos and commentaries and so many other tools that Christians in the West are ultimately going to be without excuse for their biblical ignorance on the Day of Judgment. Such resources are meant to supplement, not replace, our own study and time in the Word. Um, They can be very helpful things. I use many of them. I encourage people to use many of them, but don't let them be a replacement for just time spent in the Word. Nor should tech be a replacement for relationships. Uh, I know for me personally, uh, COVID lockdown revealed to me uh, just the limits of digital relationships. Uh, I remember being at the Chinese church where it got locked down. If you thought it was bad anywhere else, I I promise it was worse there. 
Um, I, I still remember preaching a sermon while staring at a tree out of my window because the screen was here. I was, I was out of my mind. Um, and, and so these things are not good. Uh, we were meant for physical relationship. And so it can serve as a supplement. Say, I have a mentor in Seattle. I love talking to this man on Skype through a screen or other whatever. So I talk to him. It's great. But when he's in town, I don't call him and say, hey, let's meet over Skype. No, let's grab coffee. Let's enjoy some time with one another. Brother Lawrence made popular the idea of practicing the presence of God. Mastering technology requires us to practice the presence of people. Intentionally make eye contact and greet people in Kroger. That even applies to you if you work there. See the, see the human in the drive through uh, not just some means to a meal. Uh, understand that these are people who probably don't want to be there. I know, because I used to be a human in a drive through and I didn't want to be there. Um, and, and so engage with people, talk to people, recognize that it's, they're not just a means to an end, but a human being for whom Christ died. And, and talk to them, love them. Uh, when you're gathered together as a family over a meal, keep phones out of sight. Just try to practice the presence of people. Secondly, family contracts and or boundaries. Now, in 10 years at the Cincinnati Chinese Church, the counseling issue I dealt with the most was how to deal with addiction to the digital world. Uh, For boys, this would usually take the form of video games. For girls, this usually took the form of social media, but there's a fair amount of overlap. Uh, First and foremost, I would encourage you to set clear boundaries with your kids uh, with consequences determined ahead of time. It, It is really hard to come up with consequences on the spot. Uh, as, as a parent. Uh, so you, you see your kid doing something stupid, it's like, yeah, go to your room while I think about what you're going to do. Uh, instead, if you already have a, an infraction and a punish, punishment determined, when it happens, you can refer to contract and be like, ah, oh, sorry, guy. Uh, what it says, this is what's going to happen now. And, and so it, it's a little bit healthier in that respect. And so this will look differently from family to family. In, in our family's case, we treated video games like a reward. Uh, For instance, I know when my kids want to play video games because I could be sitting there reading a book and suddenly the floor is getting swept uh, and the dishes, the dishes are being washed and and other things are are being cleaned. And I'm I'm like, huh, I know exactly what my kids want. And and also they have learned to do that even even before they ask me for video games. It is not a guarantee they will get them. They they won't even ask until they've done that. Train them up. Train them up. But um, the point is, you know, find some, some rules that work for your family. Set time limits. Make access, access to screens public in your home. Uh, make it a rule not to touch your phone until you spent time with the Lord that, that day. Stop checking phones after a certain time in the evening. Uh, consider how difficult it is for you, parents, to exercise self-control in this area and then ask yourself if it is wise to leave an Xbox, a smartphone, or a computer in your kid's room. It's not. Uh, much of our kids' struggles are a reflection of our own lack of discipline, boundaries, or involvement in parenting. Students, uh, when your parents try to implement these things this week, which I hope they do, and recall hope in Christianity is an eager expectation, not wishful thinking. Uh, and so I, I hope that you implement some of these things this week. And children, I pray that, and ask that you would be receptive to your parents trying to be loving uh, in centering these things in your home. Don't fight them on it. Uh, with my children, I often present what I call the illusion of control. For example, Evan, would you rather wash the windows or take the dogs out? And he said, "Wash." Them. wow, that's usually not the answer. Either way, I win, right? Uh, because whether it's one, one task or the other, I'm not doing both. Uh, and, and so... In that sense, uh, the, the child takes the ownership of an, of an activity, and I win. Uh, they, they're taking care of things around the house. And so when it comes to writing a family contract, you can include do's and don'ts, and this can result in a lot of wins for you uh, because it's already setting up some expectations. Have consequence, consequences established in the contract so you don't have to wing it when discipline comes. It holds you as the parent accountable to your family because your kids see when you say, uh, Get off your video game. They see that. They see that. Um, it's, it's important. If you're wondering what such a digital contract may look like, uh, that book I mentioned earlier, The Digital Invasion, includes some helpful examples. And ironically enough, you can just search Google uh, for, for some helpful resources here as well. 
Thirdly, reflective questions. There are a number of questions you can ask yourself to assess if your use of technology is wise or foolish. Who is this edifying? How? Does this provide me with healthy rest? Would I be willing to engage in this if my parent or spouse was sitting next to me? Does this supplement fellowship and relationships? How is this advancing the kingdom of God? Where do I see Christ in the midst of this? You should get the idea. Regularly evaluate your own heart and its disposition towards this, engage, towards this engagement with tech. It can, be, it can be edifying. It can advance the kingdom of God. I have seen uh, video games used for the glory of God. I really have. Uh, but it's not every single time. And, and so you have to think these things through and consider what this looks like in your respective lives. Fourthly, tools for your tools. Technology is a tool, and there are many tools for this tool. Apps uh, that help one manage time as well as accountability. For example, Microsoft Family and Google Family each can help parents manage their their children's screen time. Uh, If you're an adult who cannot really be held accountable in that regard, Cold Turkey is a very helpful resource. I am easily distracted. Uh, When I'm writing a sermon and I don't want to be writing a sermon anymore, I want to know what's going on in the world of baseball or football or any other number of things. And so the way that cold turkey works is you can plug in certain websites or things that are tempting for you, and it just restricts access for however much time you determine. Uh, So if I know that I want to get something done for the next four hours, I cut off my access to it. It's just helpful resources to, to help you in management of your own time. Uh, There's also a lot of software to address the issue of pornography. Uh, These include Accountable to You, Covenant Eyes, X3 Watch, and more. Uh, They each have their pros and cons. Uh, If you're not familiar with how this kind of software works, uh, let's let's say that uh, I get it. Uh, I would enter in a couple emails of people that I trust, say my wife and Ben or something like that. Now, let's say I look up something shady. Uh, they will then be notified that I have looked at some shady stuff, and they should come talk to me and, and, and hold me accountable. That's generally how that software works. Uh, it's a lot harder to get on sh- shady websites when you know someone's going to come ask you about it. Uh, and so I find it to, to be a very helpful resource in that regard. Uh, if I had to recommend one, I think Accountable to You is the easiest one to navigate as somebody who's really not a tech guy. Um, but I'd encourage you to invest in it. Uh, I've looked into a lot of this stuff, and most of the free options just really aren't that good uh, and, or really, really just hard to navigate. So your, your sexual purity is worth $5 a month. Uh, just throwing that out there. Finally, accountability. There are a number of apps and tools you can add to your phone, but nothing can ultimately replace good old-fashioned accountability. Best served over coffee. Uh, And so whether a spouse, a parent, a mentor, or a friend, make your stewardship of tools and time a a regular point of conversation. Confess when you've wasted time. Uh, Ask your friend to hold you accountable on this. Ask them how they're doing uh, with these things. And if they feel like, if they can see where they're lifting up or or exalting God in their use of these things or not. Uh, You can put restrictions on your devices uh, and you can circumvent them and override them. Uh, There's really no resource you can get that you can't get around. We're wicked people. We like to get around things. Uh, And so ultimately, it's it's much harder to just get around a face-to-face conversation when you tell somebody, this is what's going on in my life. And so I encourage you, let these tools, let apps be a supplement, but not a replacement uh, for accountability. Now, that was a lot. And so to sum things up, uh, technology is the stewardship of tools and time. Scripture gives us a lot of freedom in figuring out how to manage tools, and so we should not flee all technological advancement. Nor should we think it's all great, because a lot of the values of our technological condition are at odds with the very nature of God himself. Technology becomes a fortress against the knowledge of God when it takes the form of a false gospel promising victory over death and other things that Jesus himself achieved. And so as we go forth from here, I encourage you, Uh, to consider where to apply some of these things in your own life that you might master them um, in your own day-to-day walk with the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to pray ultimately for victory in this. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to where uh, perhaps there is a stronghold upon us in, in this area. It is so pervasive, so all over, that it can be hard to 
nail something down. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to where we need to uh, address some of these things and prioritize things in our own hearts. Lord, I want to pray for peace in the home. I know as discussions may be had about this from parent to child, from spouse to spouse, uh, it can be heavy and it, there can be a lot of contention. And so I pray that there would be peace uh, and that you would ultimately be glorified uh, in the homes here and that you'd be glorified in our midst. Oh Lord, we love you. In your sons, let me pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.